reconvene the Parker Town Council meeting at 7 o'clock p.m. All council members are present with the exception of Councilwoman Renee Williams. Do we have, we've got some kids in the audience, right? I see a whole bunch. Okay, here's the deal, guys. If you're under 18, come on down. Come on down. Under 18, come on down. Look, half of them are like, see, Mom, this is why I said I didn't want to go to town council tonight. <laughs> All right. Come on down, guys. Under 18, come on down. She's good, huh? I get into gloves. You're shaving your head. <laughs> Nobody's head is getting shaved. Get the shaving cream. Yeah, yeah, get the cream. Yeah, but I think he just signed up, so I'm just saying. All right, so all of you who are under 18, come forward here. You guys got, come up, you guys have a big job to do. First job is this, smile, really big. Let me see the big smiles. All right, we got, you can, that's better. All right, you're gonna be leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance, which is the most important part of tonight's meeting. Don't worry about all the people behind you. They got your back, they're good to go. We're gonna all turn around and face the flag, put our hands on our hearts, you guys know what to do. But it's gonna get real quiet real fast because you guys are in charge. So start saying the Pledge of Allegiance when you're ready. No one's gonna tell you to start it. You start it and we will all follow. Sound good? All right, the floor is yours, kids. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Fantastic job. Give them a round of applause. Way to go, guys. See, that was pretty easy. There was no quiz. There was nothing like that. <laughs> and they didn't have to shave their heads. And they didn't have to shave their heads. Yet. Coming. Yet. Hey, I've called people out during meetings to shave their heads, and so don't kid yourself. I'll do it. Although, you know, you've got to have the big wild hair for me to call you out. All right. So next item up we've got is uh, special presentations. So, um, if you guys council, yeah, we you... don't have anything tonight. I'm sorry. We don't have anything tonight. No, we do. I'm just kidding. Oh, you'd be the smart aleck. All right, <laughs> council. If you'll indulge me, I'm going to come down to, to talk from uh, the floor down here. For those of you who who I've met or have known or follow me on social media or have had a chance to talk to, you guys know that one of, my, one of my favorite things to talk about is your job as citizens of Parker, your job as citizens in the United States, and engaging your government and your community. One of the most frustrating things we have to deal with is that, unfortunately, there's some people who just don't know what a town government does for its citizens. Now, one of the things that we have here in Parker uh, along with our civic academy is we actually have a police civic academy. That's what most of you are here for, I'm assuming, or just wanted to see what color flannel I would wear at time. That's okay, <laughs> time of blue. Um, so with our police academy, if you're not, for those of you who are not familiar with what our, our citizens police academy is, it's a 10 weeks citizen program, gives participants firsthand information about how their police department in Parker, Colorado operates. Classes focus on criminal law, mounted patrol, evidence, dispatch, traffic laws, accident reconstruction, DUI laws, canines, and lots of other topics. In addition to the interactive classes, <laughs> participants are able to attend an optional trip to the, to the law enforcement firearms training facility where they fire weapons used by the Parker Police Department. Did any of you guys get use a taser? No. Did you, did you get taste? <laughs> Every year they threaten to do that to me and I have not signed up for it yet. She wants to really bad. Yes, no. right. I actually, I think I saw her, you get taste when you're in the academy, didn't I? Or the video of it, maybe. I've seen the video of it. It's good. Go to my YouTube channel. I'm just kidding. No. Um, but that is definitely a cool part of it. And then, uh, so they do, they get to learn how your police department operates in the town of Parker. I will say on behalf of council, and for the amount of time that I've been involved with the town of Parker, I will challenge anyone to find a police department in this country better than the Parker Police Department. Not only do the men and women in Parker Police Department serve in their law enforcement capacity, but they are true community servants, devoting thousands of hours of volunteer time in our community to make Parker a better place. They're not just about writing a ticket when something goes wrong, they're truthfully there to be community servants. We are a better place because of the men and women who put on the uniform every day. So you guys choosing to be in the Citizens Academy have gotten a small taste of what it is and what they do for our community. So tonight is your night. Chief King, come on down, Chief. Chris? You and Chris are gonna come down and we're gonna, you guys are gonna talk for another 42 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll 
Yeah. Yeah. No, that's no. uh, absolutely. Well, thank you all for taking the time the 10 weeks to participate in the academy. I think when I first came up and spoke to you guys the first night, I said, if you don't, if you weren't happy with the academy, then you can get your money back. <laughs> anybody, anybody here want their money back? <laughs> Good. No. <laughs> Do you guys feel like that you know so much more about your police department? Yes. So when people ask you, when people ask you, why do the police do certain things? that you now can tell your neighbors, this is some of the reasons why they do what they will do. So you guys are ambassadors, and I appreciate your families allowing you to be a part of this, and uh, thank you so much. And I'd like to also to give a shout out to Chris Peters and Bree Rock and our staff for the great job they did. David Brim's in. <laughs> Real quick, I just want to thank those uh, that attended uh, for your dedication. It's 10 weeks plus a couple like tonight and the range day. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's a big investment for you. It's an investment for us. I love doing it and everyone that teaches at the Academy really enjoys uh, connecting with you guys too. We've run 25 Academies so far. This is the 25th and we'll have after tonight graduated 608 citizens in this Academy. So, Absolutely. Come so on if we can get the graduates down here, we'll take a nice group photo. Tall people in the back. Not so tall people in the back. <laughs> No rabbits. All the options in uniform Can I get you guys to stand down for just one second? Okay, we'll do one official one. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Okay, all right, everybody else can go. <laughs> These get harder and harder because the phones don't make any sounds when you take pictures. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, the way you stand there like this, you never know. They're not really taking pictures. Nobody's actually checking. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you guys very much. And all of you are more than welcome to stay all night. We'll be here till about midnight. <laughs> and with that, half the room just left. That's right. All right. Next item up on our agenda is our Parker, of Ch Parker Chamber of Commerce updates. Do we have a uh, representative from the chamber here tonight? I believe that they Chief. were over at the Secor grand opening. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. With that, I'm Jeff. You're probably here for the DBA, correct? Come on down. Hey. Is that mic? the mic's not on? Mic's not on. All right. Do you want me to yell now? Yeah, a little closer <laughs> into it. There you go. Radio voice. All right. Is that better? Yes. yes. 
So we just finished our second annual chili cook-off on October 20th, and proud to say we had another successful event. Uh, Debbie can attest to this, we actually had the most, uh, our coldest chili cook-off ever. Mm. Did you say the coldest? Yes. I was inside at bartending, so it was nice and toasty in there. I don't... It was windy. It wasn't out. We were not worried about it. <laughs> <laughs> Outside looked cold. Uh, the cold temperatures did affect our attendance from last year, but we still had a good turnout, and the event had 26 contestants. This year, we also added a contest with the four local breweries in Parker, which was a big success. Uh, Downhill, Barnett & Sons, Welcome Home, and Los Dos participated, and they brought their best beer to pair with chili. Uh, our follow-up meeting after the event brought more ideas for next year to make the event even better. So we're really looking forward to that and looking at the calendar and making sure that we don't do it the same day the Broncos play. That's important. Every or, time. Or fall break. Or fall break. Mm -hmm. So in addition to the chili cook-off, we're reviewing the calendar for next year to discuss other potential events that would help drive more business to downtown Parker. Our next board meeting is tomorrow afternoon, and our next membership meeting is next Wednesday the 13th. I am happy to answer any questions you ha might have. Thank you much, Jeff. Council, questions? No. Nope. Keep up the good work. Great. Thank Appreciate you, Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Next up on our agenda is public comment. This is general public comment. This is an opportunity for you to address council on items that are not on our agenda. If uh, you're here for an item that is on the agenda, there'll be a moment for public comment at that time. So these are general items. No action will be taken on them. Uh, the way public comment works is uh, people can sign up ahead of time up to 30 minutes before the meeting. And uh, we do a 30 minute window for public comment before the meeting. And if there's anyone still waiting for public comment, general public comment, and uh, they'll have it after the meeting so that everyone can have an opportunity. So we've got two people. So I'll go ahead and open up public comment at 7.12 p.m. We've got two people signed up. First up is, um, let's see here, we've got Chris Rawson. Chris, come on down. Yeah, but that you're, you're marked as a town resident, so you get priority over non-town residents. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> Mike's the second one. He's like, I'm kind of a town resident, almost. Okay, that's fine. Name and address for the, well, I've got your name and address here, so you don't have to state it, so there's a little clock on the wall above me. When you start going, it's going to start counting down. All right. Uh, so thank you, uh, Town Council, for taking my comment tonight. Um, I kind of came down here, um, and I've been thinking about something for quite a while, and, and so let me just start out with a quick uh, story. So I've been called the bike guy here in the town of Parker. I guess I'm the only one who rides a bike, which is not true. There's <laughs> other bike riders out there. Um, but... As a story, I want to say that I do ride my bike on the trails and on the roads, but one thing I notice as well is that people walk on those trails, and sometimes they jog on the roads as well. And so I come away with a thought when I'm in this town of, we're an inclusive town. We do things for more than just one group. So as a bicyclist, I would love to see more bike trails everywhere. Um, and if I was walking, I want to see more trails. I bring that up for one reason. As a town, as I've noticed in the last 10 years since I've been here, 10, 11 years, this council and past councils have been, like I said, very inclusive and very interested in making sure that everybody feels welcome. And what I want to say is, as a resident over the last six months to a year, I've noticed a theme um, in this town from folks, and maybe I've been guilty of it too, that have started to segment other folks out based on what they live in. And I've seen people come to this podium and say, I just want to make sure there's not apartments, patio homes, whatever it is. And what I want to say as a town resident is this. I'm, I would like to call on the council for one thing, and as bold as may be is, I think it's time for the council to pass a resolution, non-binding, that says that people in this town live in apartments, they live in condos, they live in patio homes, they live in senior homes. They live in all types of, of housing. As I've been known to say, we all choose the plywood box we like to live in, and it doesn't really matter. And before that type of segmentation takes over this town, where we start to look at people and say, well, what kind of place do you live in? Well, I live in a house. Well, I live in an apartment. I don't like where you live in. That's not the town we are, right? Because if you think about it, and I'm going to be a little bit pro-apartment here, is I used to live in one. Typically, people with kids tend to start out in apartments. They may tend to live in apartments for the rest of their life. Um, we know that in this town, we want to see kids, right? and they're gonna live in places that may be less expensive. People that are seniors, they're not always gonna live in a house. They might live in an apartment or a senior home. 
So I think I would ask the town council that to think about a non-binding resolution that says we accept all people from all types of living situations and we're going to make sure that everybody feels welcome here no matter what they live in. And I think it's time to nip it in the bud. So that's what I'm up here to say. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Appreciate it. All right. So the next we have up is Mike Smith. But Mike, you want to wait, correct? You said for item on the agenda. Okay. That's fine. Um, anyone else here for public comment that did not get an opportunity to sign up? Okay. Seeing none, we'll close public comment at 7.15 p.m. and move on to reports, items, from uh, and comments from mayor and council. How about we do Debbie? Okay. Um, John looked tense, so I didn't want to go. I have nothing, so. <laughs> Debbie. Uh, Councilman Tolborg and I had a Parks and Rec meeting this afternoon, and I can say that uh, there has been some resurgence of interest in aquatic facilities. That's, that, is, that is something that has been off and on here in this community for a long time. As people know that our, um, our pool at the Rec Center is, is very well used by many different competitors and we would like to be able to provide more than we have now but that has not been the case and we have looked into this for years at least since 1996 that I know of so that's something that has occurred and then uh, Councilman Renee Williams and I ha she was on a telephone conference call we had a human resource meeting this afternoon uh, I can tell you that they have f completed the Cronus implementation update that'll be effective uh, January 7 uh, 2020 they finished the uh, full-time uh, employees compensation study the part-time plan has been started uh, and the um, benefits advisory group idea is kind of coming to fruition uh, with the SMEs which is the special Subject, Subject matter, matter expert. expert. There we which go. I, we, we decided I could be the subject matter expert in some things. I did have um, a meeting two weeks ago with uh, P3, and I don't have those notes with me, but you know kind of what has is everything is still progressing forward from the previous uh, report. And that's all I have. Jeff. Thank you. I... I want to start off with, uh, with Chris Rawson. Thank you for your comments. I, I appreciate them. I think your suggestion has merits, today. and I would, I would certainly be up to exploring that because I think you hit the nail on the head. Second, um, had Parker Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors meeting, uh, I believe it was last week or the week before, and just want to remind the council that the uh, chamber has invited us to a get-together with them I guess has been done in the past where we get together as a group and that's November 14th at Barnett and Sons and certainly anybody else that wants to come is more first, than welcome. This is the first time at a brewery. I'm down. Hey. For hey. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. And it's a game night. That's a game night. It's a game night. Okay. Cheryl. That's it for me. I don't have anything. Been out of circulation here for a couple of weeks. <laughs> John? I have nothing. All right. Josh? <laughs> Uh, not much. I will say that I uh, spent the last two weeks, um, I chair the uh, Cherry Creek Basin Water Quality Authority, um, and uh, our job is to protect the water that goes into the reservoir. And uh, our director has always worked for a management company that we employ, and he has left that management company. And so the last two weeks I've been on the phone off and on with lawyers and CEOs and, and the director himself, and we have managed to hire our first employee for the, for the authority, and we will now have a full-time uh, manager and this, the same gentleman. So uh, we're very, very, very happy. It's been a tense couple of weeks. Um, the gentleman, Chuck Reed, is, is uh, invaluable to the authority. His historical knowledge is, is awesome. Pass on the best to Chuck. He was there when I was on yes. the authority, too. That's great. All right. Um, for me, um, Kristen, I was hoping you could give us an update on um, a report on the Citizens Initiative, please. Mayor and Council, thank you. Uh, what the town attorney is handing to you is the uh, a memorandum from the town clerk. As you're aware, uh, the committee to save Pine Curve 3.0 and the committee to save Pace Center parking submitted petitions on October 9th, 2019. 
Uh, on Monday, October 21st, the town clerk issued certificates of insufficiency to both committees. Those are attached to the memorandum that you're receiving now. Uh, on Tuesday, October 22nd, both committees submitted notices of intent to amend their petitions. Those are also attached to the memorandum. At that time, the town clerk's office provided the committees with 40 supplementary petitions, which would have allowed for approximately 2,000 additional signatures. As you'll note on the certificates of insufficiency, they were uh, short, uh, roughly 1,700 signatures uh, for each committee. The committees had until Friday, November 1st to submit additional signatures to cure the insufficiencies. And as of 11.59 p.m. on November 1st, neither committee submitted any supplementary petitions to the town clerk. Uh, therefore, she is uh, under the charter. She's required to present those certificates of insufficiency to uh, the council, uh, which I am doing on her behalf. And according to the Home Rule Charter, this will be a final determination as to the insufficiency of the petitions. Are there any questions? Council, any questions? None. Kristen, I just, just so it can be on the record, so everyone's aware, Carol, our town clerk, stayed at, up at her residence till 11.59 p.m. that night, just in case, even though business operations were closed in the town at 5, in case the supplementary petitions were hand delivered to her house here in Parker, correct? Okay, thank you. All right, we're gonna go ahead and move on to the next item, which is our consent agenda. Consent agenda items are considered to be routine and will be enacted with one motion and one vote. Uh, unless a council member asks to have something removed for further discussion. Uh, ordinances that are on the consent agenda are for introduction only and will not be removed for discussion. So council in front of you, you have consent agenda items 7A through 7H. I move to approve items 7A through 7H, please. Second. Okay, we have a motion from Josh and a second from Debbie. Council, in just a sec, your computers will pop open with your voting box. Motion passes unanimously. Next item on the agenda is item eight. These are our public hearings. First up, we've got item 8A. This is a public hearing for ordinance number 1.539 on first reading. This is a bill for an ordinance to adopt the 2020 budget and to make appropriations for the same. For those of you who are in the audience who are probably going, wait a minute, I've heard the mayor say a bunch of times that first readings are on consent agenda and, and are brought into the public domain. That is correct. But with big, 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 big items or controversial items, we will have a separate hearing, public hearing for the first reading. Budget is a big deal because we're spending your money. So tonight is first reading and then there will be a second reading in two weeks. Mary Lou. That is correct. Thank you very much, Mayor. And I have to tell you, I walked in tonight, it was a finance director's dream, full <laughs> chambers for See? a budget presentation. Everyone's going to hear your numbers. Yay. <laughs> And, and then they all, then they all I have to out. have a conversation oh, with the chief, apparently. <laughs> you so. should have had Rhonda go and lock the door so they all had to listen to the budget. <laughs> Finance Civic Committee. <laughs> yeah, Finance <laughs> Civic Academy. That's what we need to have. <laughs> and you get to shoot guns at the end of it, then everyone will come. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to talk numbers. That's my forte rather than <laughs> shooting. <laughs> so tonight is the first public hearing on the budget. This is a presentation that... Um, most of council has seen previously. It is a shortened, much shortened version of what was presented at the budget retreat on September 27th. I think one of the most important takeaways, particularly for citizens listening, is tonight we're on the next to last step for the budget, and yet um, this is the first public hearing and the first opportunity really for the public to hear much about it. But for the edification or education of our citizens, there has been much discussion on the budget with council prior to this time. We started back on September 27th with a budget retreat, which was about a three hour presentation. Um, and then also on last Monday at the study session, we had another opportunity for questions on the budget. 
So we had three budget challenges as we looked at forward into how we were going to pull together the 2020 budget this year. The first one, and you'll see this repeated throughout the presentation because it's just a theme, it's the finance department staying in lockstep with the expectations of council, that expectation being that we, we maintain a certain level of cash in our general fund. The second challenge that we face is the fact that we have a reduced amount of new or incremental cash coming in. And I'm going to talk a lot about cash tonight because that is what is important from a governmental accounting perspective. We don't function on net income that has non-cash items going on. We like the cash that we can touch and feel that comes in the door and we touch and feel it as it goes out the door. And then also the last one was um, the balancing of the kind of that, that stress, that tension that needs to occur all the time between how do we balance the needs of the community versus also maintaining the investment in our employees. So we have done that also throughout this budget. We also created four budget guidelines. This was working in conjunction with Michelle. The first one, again, is maintaining that cash balance. The second one is the implementation of the compensation study and maintaining that emphasis on our employees. The um, compensation study was completed a couple of months ago, and we'll see the dollar amount associated with that as we go forward. The third guideline was addressing some staffing needs within the organization, both within the police department as well as several of the administrative departments. The last guideline is the funding of certain one-time um, activities. The two that you see here on the slide are just examples of what is included in this budget. The theme for this year is repurposing. We've talked in past years about achieving that financial sustainability and acknowledging that it's how we're going to have to continue to move forward. This year we took and kind of took that concept of recycling, um, gave it a different name of repurposing, and um, that is how we approached our budget with uh, all of the departments. I am going to be talking about only the general fund here in the first part of the presentation, so keep that in mind if you have questions to that extent. So we've talked about sales tax um, plenty in the past and also um, at the budget retreat. We have about 70% of our general fund revenue comes in as sales tax. 2% growth, which is what is budgeted for 2020, equates to incremental revenue of about $725,000. We have comparisons to four of our um, municipalities in the Denver area, you can see that we have growth rates in sales tax from um, just under flat to up to 6%. Right now, our sales tax here at the town is sitting at just over 5%. We ticked up in a month when typically we go down. So we're going to see what happens in the last two months of the year and where we end up. But we are budgeted at 2% for the budget. This is just a quick pictorial um, view of our sales tax growth, which has been declining over the last several years. If we look at our top five revenue sources, and these are the majority of our revenue in the general fund, sales tax, like I said, makes up the majority of it. You can see it's 36, almost $37 million projected to grow at that 2%. The bottom line for these five is growth of just over 2%, and the reason for that is just because our sales tax dollars are so huge in volume. We do have a 15.5% increase budgeted for our real property taxes. That is a reflection of the fact that 2019 was a reassessment year. We will collect on that in 2020. So if we go back to talking about repurposing, Let's look at where we were able to identify some additional cash that we could work with for 2020. We have four sources. The largest is the debt refunding savings that came about 
when we refinanced or refunded the um, 2009 certificates of participation this summer. The second largest category comes in the area of one-time studies or projects that were budgeted for this year that do not need to be rebudgeted. So they have that funding in place. It's enough to complete the, the um, projects or studies. And so that money is freed up for us to redirect or repurpose for another use. Incremental revenue comes in at $900,000. This is revenue above and beyond the revenue that was in the 2019 budget. And then as we collected the budget information from the departments, we also were able to identify a cash source of $620,000 for expenditures in 2019 that departments identified would not occur. So you can see from the total, we've identified just under $4 million of incremental cash sources that now we can use for projects and programs that we believe are important for 2020. So what are those? We have a list of them. We have just over $2 million that have been identified as important to um, invest in our employees. Those amounts range from the $750,000 that is for performance pay for employees that is budgeted at a 3% level for 2020. And that amount also includes the step increases for our PD officers. The compensa compensation study that was completed, it was really good news. You see $300,000 here. If we had not been keeping up with the level of compensation for our employees that is common across other municipalities, we would have seen a much larger number there. So this is a good indication that we've been doing a good job up to this point and did not have a huge gap that we needed to fill as we look at 2020. We have an additional six employees. We're gonna talk about those on another slide. So we'll go into more detail on that slide, but that's costing additional almost 400,000. And then the last item is probably the most complex. It's adding $600,000 to our medical benefits fund. The town is basically self-funded, or self-insured, sorry. Um, also self-funding then, because we are self-insured. So what we have had over the past couple of years are very high claims, both in um, 2018, the end of 2018, and throughout 2019. That has pulled our cash balance in the medical benefits fund down to a level that is below what is suggested for us to maintain. Just like an insurance company has to keep cash on hand to meet claims that we would file, um, we have to keep cash on hand for the claims that our employees file. So we are increasing that cash balance by $600,000. That will bring us up to about um, a million two, I believe it is, which is the high end of where we are um, guided to keep our cash. Again, with all of those employee-related items, that accounts for about $2 million. The next category is our studies and projects. We have two studies. Um, the first one is our master facilities study. We have places throughout the town where we have um, double and triple stacking of employees going on. We have over 30 facilities here in the town. So we have um, a lot of need to stay on top of what the needs are as we go forward and look into the future. The um, second study that is included is the last item there, the Parks and Rec Internal Assessment Study. This is an opportunity excuse me, an opportunity to look within the Parks and Rec Department at improvements that could be made there. The two middle items in this category are one-time um, projects, I guess, or expenditures that we will, could have undertaken. The first one was were the costs associated with the annexation of the buoy property. Um, that's probably one of the most specific numbers you'll see in the budget because it's um, down to the tens of dollars. And the second item there is the potential special election that could have occurred. The last item um, as far as cash uses, uses is the additional capital of $1.1 million that you see there. Uh, within the general fund, we don't have a lot of gen um, capital expenditures, but we do have some 
Um, they range anywhere from a chiller for town hall that will cost $300,000 down to all of $7,000 for a skid steer snowblower attachment. So you can see the uh, variety of items that the town needs to buy that falls into that category. In total then, we are identifying cash uses of just under $3.8 million. And so we are basically balanced between the uh, cash that was identified that was incremental and the cash that we need for these projects and programs. So let's look at some of these in a little bit more detail. First of all, the salary and benefit assumptions, the $300,000 again for the funding of the compensation study results, the 3% performance pay and police department step plan funding, and then again, the 600,000 for the medical benefits fund. I mentioned the six positions that we'll be adding on a full-time employee basis in the budget. Three of those actually come within our police department. One of those is the SRO position that council has previously approved. The other two are a little bit different um, animal. We have been um, authorizing the police department to hire up to four positions, but we have not in the past provided the funding for that. We are in this budget going to provide the funding for two of those overhires, so they will become actual potential employees, and we will have just two employees or two positions identified in the overhire status. In the administrative category, we have one position in each of legal, HR, and finance being added in this budget. They each come with their own stories also. The legal department is adding an attorney and funding that position through a decrease in their external legal fees. HR is unfreezing a position. Two years ago when we went through our uh, reductions to get us aligned with our sales tax revenue, we had frozen a position in HR. So this is actually unfreezing that position and moving forward with the hiring there. And then within the finance department, several years ago there had been uh, three positions that were reduced. We are going to bring back one of those, uh, repurpose it, just like uh, with the budget, because we have some uh, need to meet both internal and external reporting requirements. All right, from an operational expense, this is probably one of the best slides in the whole presentation. Um, over a two-year period, we have seen only a 5.5% increase in our operational expense. We identify operational expense as supplies and purchase services. So that 5.5% comes out to 2.75% a year. Basically, our costs have been rising with the cost of inflation. This just um, is fantastic work on the part of all of our departments to keep expenses down and to continue to incur only those items that are necessary. So from a capital perspective, again, I mentioned that we have 1.1% or $1.1 million budgeted in 2020. That includes 19 projects and our purchases that will be funded. Fleet replacement is not included in that. That is in a separate fund, so we'll see that later. And then I have our definition of what is capital because that varies from organization to organization. The last item in the general fund that we need to talk about are transfers. So we have both transfers into the general fund and transfers out of the general fund. We have two that come into the general fund. The first one is from the Parks and Rec Fund to the tune of $1.2 million. What happens there is the Parks and Rec Fund funds 30% of the expenses for the Parks Department that occur in the general fund. So the Parks and Rec Fund is giving the general fund money to offset those expenses. 
Stormwater, they benefit from some of the work that is done within the Public Works Department. With stormwater sitting in an enterprise fund, it's important for them to kind of bear all of their costs. They're supposed to act like a, an outside business. And so they need to have responsibility for all of the expenses associated with the work that they do. We are dealing with this situation in the form of a transfer. So stormwater is reimbursing the general fund for that work that is done within public works. We then have two uh, transfers that go from the general fund out to other funds. The first one is the cultural fund for $1.4 million. That transfer funds some of the operating expense and also all of the capital that occurs within that fund. And then the transfer from the general fund to the debt service fund is in conjunction with the 2014 COPs. Certificates of Participation. All right, what does all this mean? We get down to a cash summary. And uh, this is kind of how we tie things together. It's not an income statement, it is a cash summary. So we've got our beginning cash and our ending cash and you'll see that for 2020, we are projecting that the cash balance that we'll have with the level expenses being appropriated brings us to 32.3%. The guideline passed by council is that that amount should be a minimum of 25%. So we are in excess of that as we go into the budget year. So in summary, for the general fund, we have maintained cash in excess of council's guidance. We have what I believe is a conservative budget, particularly on the revenue side with what we're starting to see with sales tax. We are maintaining all existing community programs, and we are continuing to recognize the value that our employees bring to the town. I do want to just touch on some of our other funds. We have over 10 additional funds here at the town. Uh, some of them have probably more importance from a budgeting perspective than others. The first is the Parks and Recreation Fund. This is the fund where um, the half cent of sales tax for Parks and Rec comes into. And the expenditures here are primarily capital expenditures and also transfers out to other funds. The Recreation Fund, the source of revenue in this fund are the um, fees for service or charges for services, and then the expenses are all the expenditures related to providing the classes and facilities at our recreational um, locations. The cultural fund, their revenue is coming in primarily through ticket sales or um, class registrations. Their operating expenses are primarily the costs associated with bringing all of the various programs to the town. The next three funds here are what we refer to as our internal service funds. They're all departments or divisions within the town that provide services to the rest of the departments. Our fleet services fund, just like the other two that you will see, their revenue source is coming from charges to all of the other departments that benefit from their services. The expenditures for fleet primarily um, are related to the purchase of vehicles for the next year. Our facility services work in the same way. Revenue comes in from all of our departments with facilities and our expenditures are the costs associated with maintaining those. Technology management or IT, revenue's the same thing and the expenditures here are primarily the equipment and uh, software expenditures that we have during the course of a year. Our public improvements fund, this is the fund where the majority of our large infrastructure projects reside. You can see from the dollar amount, um, we have some very large items that go through here. In our 2020 budget, our expenditures um, are a little over $19 million. $11 million of that is related to the widening of the Cottonwood Bridge. And we can see a quick list of them. You'll see they go from the $11 million down to a couple hundred thousand dollars, though, very quickly. And go over to another page with a total um, project list that adds up to $19.4 million. 
And our last fund is our stormwater utility fund. The revenue for this fund comes from uh, those owners of residential and commercial property here in the town. And the expenditures primarily are related to capital projects, or at least projects. Um, in 2020, the two largest ones are work on Lemon Gulch, and then also, and I, Oh, Cherry Creek at KOA. So those are the two largest projects, and that's about a million and a quarter just between those two projects. Uh, the Stormwater Fund is also proposing the addition of one new FTE for 2020. And that is the end of the presentation. I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Thank you very much. Council, do you have any questions? Just a, a quick one. At this time, is it still um, in the best interest of the town to remain self-insured? If we were to go back to coverage, would it be? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I believe it is. Okay. Um, the town is about at kind of the smallest um, from an employee size perspective that you typically see it be beneficial for. Um, but I think uh, we've seen where we have been able to save some money Perfect. over the past couple of years. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. John, then Cheryl. Yeah, uh, more of a statement than, than a comment. Um, uh, myself and uh, Council Member uh, Williams uh, sit on the budget, uh, or I'm sorry, sit on the Finance Committee. So the, the timeline at the beginning um, doesn't really tell the tale. Um, uh, Mary Lou, Rhonda, and um, Renee and myself uh, have talked budget for many, many months before that. So um, we are, it seems like we're consistently talking about next year's budget. In fact, I think the last meeting we had, you were mentioning- um, 2021? 2021 budget. <laughs> yes. So, so to me, um, this, this goes well beyond the, uh, the timeline that, uh, that Mary Lou has put out there. And um, again, a, a note of thanks to um, Mary Lou, Rhonda, and the rest of the team. Thank you for um, doing this. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Cheryl. I was just wondering, in your analysis of these medical expenditures, did you look at other than just self-funding, did you actually look at those where that have some cap where you're paying a premium to cover those large expenses that go over a certain threshold, or was that not looked at? We have stopgap insurance in place. So if a claim gets over a certain limit, we do have other insurance that does kick in. Okay, thank you. <laughs> other questions? Josh? I noticed, <clears throat> excuse me, I noticed open budget is down. It'll be back up. We are anticipating with the addition of our new position that it will go back Thank up. You. <laughs> Other questions? No? Okay, we'll open it up for public comment at 7.47 p.m. if there's anyone here to address council on this item. Okay, seeing the big rush of people to the podium. <laughs> We're going to go ahead and close public comment at 7.47, and I would entertain further discussion or a motion, please. I move to approve ordinance number 1.52 on first reading and to schedule second reading and public hearing for December 2nd, um, 2019. It should okay. be. Motion by John and a second by Josh. Council, in just a sec, your vote box will pop up. Oh. Just a second, Mike. It's coming. It went out for some reason. Cheryl got kicked off. I don't know if mine came up. Can you resend the vote? What happened? If, if we're only missing Cheryl, you can do a voice. Is Cheryl the only one that's missing on there? Cheryl, what? Yes. Pardon? Josh, you're missing also. Yes. Josh. Our computers just went. Uh-oh. Time limit. Okay. Motion passes unanimously. Next item up is item 8B. This is a public hearing for Newland Crossing filing number one, minor development plat. Carolyn, you're gonna be the lead for us tonight, correct? Good evening. Give me just a second here. Where's my... So good evening, Mayor and Town Council. Tonight we will be reviewing a subdivision request 
for the Newland Crossing Filing 1 minor development. The applicant is Plan West and the representative is David Brem. The applicant's representative is present this evening to answer any questions council might have following staff's presentation. The applicant has demonstrated that all public notice requirements have been met. The applicant is proposing a minor development plat to create 16 unbuildable tracks for future residential, commercial, roadway, and trail and open space uses on approximately 101 acres. The intent is to create saleable tracks for future development. The site was annexed into the town in 2016 and zoned Plan Development, or PD. This PD allows for 450 total residential units, 14 acres of commercial development, and approximately 19 acres of floodplain and open space. As required by the annexation agreement, the plat includes separate tracks for the Newland Gulch Trail, shown here in red. Newland Gulch is a regional north-south trail that is partly constructed both north and south of the site. The proposed land uses will be illustrated here by color. The green areas are commercial and are concentrated on the six tracks near Chambers, the Chambers Road access for the development. The four residential tracks are shown in blue. The remaining six tracks include the roadway in orange, the trail in red, and the open space in light blue and labeled Newland Gulch. The property is currently used for agriculture and ranching purposes. There is 100-year floodplain present on the site. It uh, diagonally bisects the property following the Newland Gulch. Per the annexation agreement, Newland Gulch will require a bridge before development can cross from one side of the gulch to the other. The site is adjacent to single family residential development on three sides. To the north and west is unincorporated Douglas County, and to the east is Carousel Farms located within town boundaries. Adjacent properties to the south are zoned low density residential and are currently used for horse boarding and training. Two access points for the overall development have been provided on this plat. These form the backbone, if you will, for the future collector road and circulation within the development. The plat reserves the right of way for a future collector road and the Newland Gulch Trail tracks as a future pedestrian circulation component. All other internal vehicular circulation and appropriate alternative transportation provisions will be required as a component of subsequent development plats. Staff has reviewed the requested minor development plat against the town's master plan and has determined that the request is consistent with the goals noted in the master plan and provided in staff's report. The proposed plat would create unbuildable tracks for residential, commercial, roadway, trails, and open space. These uses are consistent with medium density residential development and with neighborhood centers as identified in the master land use plan and which are allowed by the zoning. In summary, the applicant is requesting the approval of a minor development plat in order to create 16 unbuildable tracks. The zoning of the property allows for the proposed uses. The applicant has demonstrated that the proposal is consistent with the master plan and is compliant with the land development ordinance for a minor development plat. The annexation requirement for separate tract for the Newland Gulch Trail has been met. A subdivision improvement agreement based on the annexation agreement will provide triggers for infrastructure as these tracks develop. On October 10, 2019, the Planning Commission voted 6 to 0 to recommend approval of the Newland Crossing Filing 1 Minor Development Plat. The Planning Commission and staff are recommending that Town Council approve the Newland Crossing Filing 1 Minor Development Plat. And that concludes staff's report. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Carolyn, thank you very much. Council, do you have any questions for Carolyn? Cheryl, then Jeff. One. You're doing a, a minor plat amendment for 16 undevelopable plats. Why is that? 
So this plat will simply create 16 undevelopable tracks, some for residential, some for commercial, some for roads, but they don't really go any deeper than that. They just create these blobs of land use that the property owner can then sell to uh, developers. Um, he wants it in separate tracks because you might have one developer that does residential development and another developer that does commercial development. So that's, that's I'm not the questioning the number of tracks. I'm questioning the term undevelopable. Exactly. They are undevelopable. They're back in front of us. They're well, undevelopable they back, because but I would assume that that would that's an assumption when they replant that that's going to happen. I was just concerned yes, about but the currently term. they're undevelopable. Correct. So the term the term just makes land that's nothing into a general blob. So they can sell it. So then when they sell it, they still have to go through the normal process that everyone else yeah, has to go it. back through. All right. And exactly. Ev yeah, every, every, the term isn't undevelopable. it's unbuildable. Build Thank you, yeah. unbuildable track, yeah. Unbuildable, I'm, yeah. Every piece of property in Parker has gone through the steps of, they first get defined as an unbuildable track because that just says this is where a house, houses are gonna go. And then that piece of land gets sold, and then they come in and they say, okay, we want it to be this, and that's where they go through the normal development. I understand the term unbuildable, but undevelopable yeah. just didn't No, un sense. unbuildable is what it is in there. Okay. Uh, I, I said, on your, on your, I didn't see in any of the documentation in our packet, but on your presentation, do you show how those 16 unbuildable blobs break down? Uh, like, yes, there was a slide. Okay, so I that, saw... I saw four, I saw six, I thought, but I didn't see how this. There are actually there. 16. Here, we'll go through it to give me one second okay. here to get back to it. Hello. There we go. So the first, um, there are six tracks in the green there that um, so will be commercial. Kind of lines yep. that so that's six. <laughs> so, and that's commercial. Right, and then there are four more that are so residential. One, two, so that's three, ten. Four. Okay. Right. Right. And then there are um, three road tracks, and there are two trail tracks, and then there is the open space tract, which is that light blue area in the middle that's labeled. So that's sixteen tracks. Thank you yeah. for that. The borders mm -hmm. are kind of hard to see on them. So yeah. Thank you for blobbing it down. <laughs> blobbing it down. <laughs> We should use more terms like that, blob. Blobbing, blob yes. The development blob. Is going to be. <laughs> and this little table to the side breaks it down into each of the tracks and tells you what those uses are going to be, whether it's future commercial, future residential, future roadway, right? whatever it is. Uh, John. Yeah, um, so I guess my question is the avigation easement we got in the referrals. Um, is, is this too early to kind of address that? Yes, and we actually get that comment from them in most applications, yeah. but at this point, it's we don't even have lots, so it's not really. And they'll get a referral; yeah. they will be referred again. Yeah. And I will tell plots. you, we'll get the same comment yeah. when those tracks okay. come in to be platted and made into buildable lots. Great, and uh, also a comment: um, th there are a couple of applicants who I look forward to, and uh, one of them is about to to grace our microphone. <laughs> Um, so, um, well, he wasn't going to. Now he has to. Well, he, he well he has the passion and enthusiasm for his project. He should have walk up music. He and should have walk up music. Even though they're unbuildable tracks or lots, Blobs. Hopefully, Blobs. he can create some kind of enthusiasm for those. Okay. Be before we're dazzled with his enthusiasm, any other questions? All right. The bar just got set super That's high, right. bro. <laughs> <laughs> you want your slides, David? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can you put up the blob slide, please? Uh, Gosh, yeah. I don't, I don't Name get an abuse. address for the record. I don't get abuse anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> Some That's abuse. Done That's, out of love. That's a lie. Um, <laughs> Mayor, Council, uh, my name is David Brem. That's spelled B-R-E-H-M. I'm with Plan West. We are land planners and landscape architects. And this is why I really like coming to Parker and, and sharing <laughs> ideas. But really, uh, it's just another really good opportunity, and that's what zoning and platting does. I'll, I'll share a couple of details with you. Um, Carol's explained the process about it. Uh, we use more complicated words than blob in our office, but I can't, <laughs> I can't share many of them with you. But Other four-letter words? Yeah, <laughs> no, 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 never. But... Um, you know, just to clarify a little bit about why we do a minor development plat. Right now it's 100 acres, and you can sell 100 acres, or you can break it up into 35 acres, but you can't sell a 10-acre parcel. 
you can't sell a 20-acre parcel. So you, you couldn't sell it to a developer to develop one of the planning areas unless you plat it. And that's why the plat. So, so then it breaks it down into sellable pieces. And to do that, you have to create the, you know, the open space, the roadway network. So there's, there's a rhyme to that reason. Why there's 16? Because what Carol didn't mention, and can we show the slide that I have up there that shows the ownership? The third one, I think. Parker is actually part of this application because Parker owns a piece of this property, if you, if you understand, if you have the history of that. So Parker went through a bunch of effort to buy the property or to acquire the property along Chambers Road um, and include that in this project. So there was a, this is the culmination of that effort between Parker, Douglas County, and this client to be able to create all that property all the way up to Chambers Road rather than live with the detention ponds that are out there today. It comes with great effort to be able to move those and to do that, but that's the intent. And there's, in the annexation agreement, there's a lot of um, detail on how that property gets transferred um, to the developer when that happens. So, um, mm -hmm. I, she's, I think, she's trying. Know, I, I think what you see on the bottom there, you'll see a horizontal line that's about, from my point of view, it's about 0.735 inches above the Chambers <laughs> Road. Yay big. Yeah, just about that big. That piece of property is actually still owned by Parker. Okay. But I think council understands that, and if you don't, we can, we can come back to it and explain it. But that itself adds like six parcels to it because the way it's split up and everything. So it, it's just a lot more pieces to it. But it's really not complicated. It's just a couple pieces to it. So I really was going to get up here and say, I'll, I'll answer your questions. And I really will answer your questions. When we started this, we said, if we make this complicated, it would, we're on the verge of making this too complicated. This is a pretty simple process. I mean, it's the next step to put this project out there for responsible development, to take advantage of that corner of Maine and Chambers, uh, to see some commercial development there. Um, again, difficult piece because of its visibility, its access and everything, but this is the next step to make that happen. Appreciate your, your attention to it and actually ask for your support and uh, favorable approval. Thank you very much, David. Questions, guys? David, just quick questions about the road, the backbone, as, as Carolyn referred to it. Um, that will be a public road? Yes, it will be. And will that be, uh, is there any obligation to the town to build that road, or will that be funded by the metro districts, future metro districts? It's, the metro district hasn't been formed, but it's, it'll be privately funded in Perfect. some form. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank it, you Dan. so much. We'll go ahead and open it up for public comment at 8.02 p.m. If there's anyone here wishing to address council on this item, come on down. Name and address for the record, please. And the same rules as before. After you do your name and address, the timer will start. Oh, I can't see that, can you? Carol, can we? Oh, Matt. Well, the Matt, that'll, that'll do it. Or that'll do it. Okay. <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, never mind. Forget map. it. We can talk about We can put the map back up that I had. The chamber. Carol, could you put the other map back up? Okay. Go. Chris Ross in 20506 Willow Bend Lane, Parker, Colorado. This was the big reason I came down here today. Um, so many times I feel like I get in late on projects and I always end up adding comments when it's a little bit too late, but this is a chance, I think, to fix kind of an issue. So bear with me just a minute. Everybody kind of imagine driving down Main Street and then turn on chambers. Either the town or the county has spent considerable money putting a awesome eight foot wide path from Main Street north, correct? that big main pathway we just put in. Everybody can imagine we just widened Chambers Road. Okay, so here's a challenge if you're walking or you're riding. By the way, I've got a church right there, Parker Bible Church. We forgot to mention there's a, there's a church in that vicinity. But if you wanna go from the new development to just to the east of where my church is, Parker Bible Church, that little triangle right there to the west and north, it's very difficult. So what I'm saying is there's no sidewalk there currently. And uh, that road is pretty quick, and we have all these neighborhoods around it. So what I'm trying to say is there's no real way to stitch all that together. 
So if we go in as planned right now and do nothing with the road and really just kind of put a basic sidewalk and we've created kind of this kind of an island where you really can't get around except by car. And what I would propose is that if we move forward, we need to, you know, put an eight-foot sidewalk in. It's an arterial, so we can do that. And we need to make sure that the roads that are in there are wide enough to accommodate not just two cars side by side, but, uh, you know, accommodate nice wide sidewalks and be able to move around within that neighborhood. So however that magic happens, that's what I'm, I'm saying here today is we can kind of make that happen now. So with one minute to spare, I'll leave you with that. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Anyone else for public comment? And then Chris will come back to that. So come on down. Yep. Name and address for the record, please. Ray Travis. I'm at 10680 Stone Meadow Drive in Parker. I'm in an unincorporated Douglas County. I'm in that little blob right to the north of this whole area. <laughs> Good terminology. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, members of council, thank you so much for letting me speak tonight. I'm here to talk about the Newland Crossing, obviously. Um, there will be a very detrimental effect on the five properties just north of this project. And you can see them just above the green line in the north and the long chambers and those little five rectangles at the top there. Exactly. So, um, this development is going to cause substantial harm to those five property owners. Four of the five homes have adults working from home. All of them have children under 18. The noise and exhaust from the trucks, the clouds of dirt, and the constant hammering and, disruptive, uh, and disruption during the uh, extended construction phase will be significant for these houses. We experienced it 12 years ago when Chambers Road was cut through and all of the dirt all of the dirt was dumped on this property. We experience it today with the ongoing build out of Sierra Ridge, which is across chambers to this. We hear all that noise. We know what will occur with this project. There is no denying it. It will happen again with this project. The permanent commercial installations will contribute to the ongoing gasoline fumes and fast food smells forever in this area. This is in addition to the permanent change in the view, the wildlife, and the environment. We want town council to require the developer to bargain in good faith with these five properties, just like the developer works so closely with the planning commission. The developers and owners should be able to recoup all the compensation when they sell off these tracks to other developer and eventual owners. So they're not going to lose anything. They're going to recoup it later on. We recommend that town council refers this filing back to the planning commission and requests that the developer and owners and other parties, including the town, come up with an acceptable plan to fully and fairly compensate the affected property owners. We want Parker Town Council to take the lead in protecting property rights of homeowners adversely affected by new development. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Appreciate it. Anyone else here for public comment on this item? You'll state your name and address for the record, please. Julie Swear, uh, 10674 Stone Meadow Drive, Parker. Um, I am also one of those five houses um, in Stonegate. Um, and as Ray stated 12 years ago or whatever it was, we did go through the um, put through of Chambers Road and just recently the widening of Chambers Road. Um, and the land directly behind our house, um, the owner of the lot has uh, benefited tremendously because all of the dirt from Chambers was dumped behind our homes. Um, so now that land is buildable. And we have um, put up with that. And, um, and then with the widening of Chambers, the noise starts well before dawn goes well past sunset, um, and it is unbearable. Just because there's an empty plot of land within town does not mean that it needs to be 
built. Um, and there needs to be some considerations for the homes that are in the area. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, anyone else here to address council on this item? Name and address for the record, please. Uh, my name is Chris Short. I'm at 10668 Stone Meadow Drive. Chris, what was your last name one more time, Sarge? Short, believe it or not. <laughs> That's all right. Um, I just wanted to echo what Ray and Julie said. Um, the development across chambers, the, the dust and the noise is out of control. Um, it's not only an inconvenience and a nuisance, but it really impacts our quality of life. Um, a lot of times we have our windows closed when we don't want to have our windows closed. Um, my wife works from home. She looks right out that window um, eight hours a day, longer, sorry. Um, and another thing I wanted to say is chambers didn't used to be there. The reservoir didn't used to be there. There used to be views of Pikes Peak. Um, I'm not for impeding progress. We definitely have to have the reservoir. We need water. Um, we need infra infra infrastructure, chambers, widening and lengthening. I'm all for that. Um, but as far as the commercial stuff, I don't think a Conoco or a McDonald's or another 7-Eleven is progress, especially when we have like three or four gas stations probably within a mile and a half. So that's all I want to say. Okay. Thank you very much. Anyone else to address council on this item? Okay. Seeing none, we'll close public comment at 8.11 p.m. Council, any further discussion items on this? I want to, sorry. Go ahead. I wanted to ask, so the track with the red track with the trails, is that a soft service trail? Do you, you don't have any idea yet the track exists? We don't know what's going to happen there yet? No, uh, the design of the trail, according to the annexation, will come with uh, the replats when they plat into buildable lots. And then I noticed to the north, Stonegate in the county has social trails. Um, do they have plans? Do we know? Have they have plans to, to put a trail at Newland Gulch? S north of this, if you follow Newland Gulch into Stonegate. Yeah, Newland Gulch is a regional trail, and so it's, it's, it's going to be a 10 foot wide. Right, concrete trail, okay. the whole length of it, because it's a regional The whole length, into the county also. Right, but exactly where it's going to be, right. this is kind of okay. about where it's going to be. Okay, and then talking to the point Mr. Rawson brought up, the parcel, the triangle with the void in the connection, um, that void would be completed if that parcel was to alter itself? Well, the uh, the whole sidewalk edge there would be would come into play at the same time the tracks are platted. Okay. Again, that part of the problem with this application is it's hard to picture that there's a whole lot of detail that's way ahead of the cart, way ahead of the horse here. Okay. And then just for the record, chambers widening and the ungodly large development to the west was done in the county, and they have different rules when they build or when they have dirt or when they have construction versus when the town has construction? Am I correct? That is correct. Thank you. We want to call them standards. Mm -hmm. Standards, thank standards. you, that's a good word. Cheryl. Yeah, I'm wondering, has staff looked at what kind of mitigation can be instituted? Uh, you know, I understand the issues of having to meet the needs of the landowner and the needs of the neighbors. What has been done to look at what the demands of the neighbors are? So again, at this point, it's a little premature because we don't really know what those are going to be. We don't really know what that corner's, how that corner is going to develop. Can you put anything into the plat that would re require an open space distance? Is, is there in the zoning a distance? That's, no. that's, that's our current standards, isn't it? We, we have our current. So, so the town does have uh, grading standards and does have hours of construction standards that can help mitigate some of the impacts um, through the process, um, but there are none specific to this. Um, the rules apply to all developments in town. Can you speak to buffers, though? Yeah, the buffer zones or open space. So there's no buffer zone in place here at this point. Because um, these are just unbuildable tracks that are being... Right. Uh, could there be? Sure. 
um, but we, we don't we aren't there yet. Okay. Mayor, could I bring a little perspective to this particular application? Sure. As a part of the negotiation to annex this property and as a part of the annexation contract, one of the objectives of the developer was to have the ability to carve this parcel up into tracks for sale for development. We're not at the development stage yet. This is just simply the track stage which will create uh, tracks for sale in some cases. These applications will come back in the future and we can certainly at that point look at mitigation based upon the town standards at that time. So addressing those things at this point as a part of this application, I would say is premature. Okay. One last question. Jeff, did you have? Yeah. Hold on. So I'm going to continue the blob conversation. So were these, <laughs> were these five homes, existing homes are, um, by the blue, is that, I don't know how to ask my question other than what does the blob behind those houses look like? What is the unbuildable track at this point being proposed look like? Residential. I know. Is it is it the point? Point two seven acres, the eight acres, the three five two. What what's the size of it? Being. Mm, I can't see that. <laughs> there, it's too small. You mean this entire blue area? He's wondering what. Yeah, what's the size of that? Which one of the I'm tracks gonna, is that one? I'm gonna guess it's twenty three point five. Oh yeah. Twenty three yeah, five oh four. If I can. Track F. Get it large enough. Or is it? Or just tell me what is that track F? behind there, behind those homes? I think track, track F is on this side. Okay. Let's go back to, hang on, we can look at. Um, can, we, can we put this up? There? Yeah, you can. I don't know. Yeah, yes, put it up on the, the David, problem was I David, couldn't get it to put, open. Just put it right up there on the X and she can zoom in on it. Okay. There we go. Whoa, oh, oh. hey, ho. Close. Too much technology. Blue screen of death. Oh, man. It's got to update. We're going to get there. It's got to update. Carolyn, in the meantime, who, who will be the water provider for this development? This is Cottonwood, actually. Cottonwood. Or Stonegate, I'm sorry. Stonegate, Stonegate Village. <laughs> I keep thinking it's Cottonwood for some okay. reason. It's 5.63. So right, so right behind that, that's open space. That's open space. Yeah. So this is with zone, this is the zoning map that's been approved sure. and adopted and recorded. Okay. So you can see there are the five houses that exist there. And we've had this conversation when we were doing the zoning, mm -hmm. you know, to be able to figure out, you know, how this might impact it. So there is, you can see a little dash line. There is a permanent um, easement, drainage easement right there. Mm -hmm. And forgive me, I forget the details of how big that is. Okay. But I believe in the, even the development guide that there is a setback from this part, this uh, this property line, to the closest we can get a home to it. Now, will there be a home? It won't be an open space track that it is today, but it'll be a home, you know, or an open space track like it's shown on here. So I think that we have accommodated in this. We, we take that seriously about how people live and how interfaces go. But on the other hand. We also think that homes adjacent from ho across from homes is a pretty good interface. The commercial isn't up there, so if nobody's standing or going to live next to a commercial piece. Wait. Okay. Does that help? Uh, mm -hmm. So, Other, so go ahead. Caroline and Bryce, um, can you give me the details on, like, fence to orange, just at some point, from? From the fence of the of the five homes to the start of the orange plot. Oh. Well, well, again, those will all come yep. when it's so platted. Just what, yeah. Oh, no, but just that dimension. Need it tonight. Just yeah, sure. We can we can scale that out. Yep. yep. Thank you. Other questions, guys? Okay. You have in front of you item eight B. Move to approve the Newland Crossing filing number one minor development plat based upon staff findings. Second. We have a motion from Josh and we have a second from John. Council, your box will pop up. Maybe. Who are we waiting on? I voted. Jeff. Jeff. Oh, I have Jeff. a box. Mm. Uh, I'm a no.
Motion passes four to one with one no vote from Jeff Toborg. Next item is item nine, which is our ordinances. And 9A is ordinance number 3.01.120 on second reading. This is a bill for an ordinance to amend Title 13 of the Parker Municipal Code regarding hemp operations in light industrial zone districts. Bryce, you're gonna lead us the way. Thank you, Mayor, members of council. There we go. As noted uh, before you tonight is a amendment, a proposed amendment to the land development ordinance regarding hemp. On May 20th, 2019, the town approved an emergency ordinance uh, to establish 180 day suspension on approving new, help, new hemp processing and sewage uses within the town. Hemp is a cannabis cousin uh, to marijuana with THC levels that are much, much lower at 0.3 tenths of a percent. Hemp is regulated by the state. And as part of this process, staff reached out to several jurisdictions um, in the South Metro area to understand how they address hemp. The processing and storage of raw hemp has significant smells um, and uses a number of flammable materials. Uh, secondary processing of hemp is not as significant or is not significantly different in terms of smell or safety than most light and industrial uses within the town. The town's light industrial zone district uh, does allow for sensitive receptors uh, such as daycares, schools, um, gyms, and other gathering spaces. Um, light industrial uses that create significant smells uh, or use large amounts of flammable materials are not appropriate near these sensitive receptors. So the purpose of this uh, proposed amendment is to create definitions for hemp processing, uh, to not allow the initial processing of hemp, um, of raw in industrial hemp in any zone district in town, uh, to allow limited industrial hemp processing in light industrial zone districts, um, to not allow the storage of raw hemp uh, anywhere within the town, to not allow growing of hemp in the light industrial district and to address potential nuisance impacts associated with hemp processing. The Planning Commission held a public meeting on October 24th and unanimously recommended that Town Council approve Ordinance Number 3.01.120, amending the Land Development Ordinance regarding hemp in the Light Industrial Zone District. And as always, I'm available for any questions you may have. Thanks, Bryce. Council, any questions for Bryce on hemp? No. Cheryl. Yeah, we've gone through this before, but I want to clarify. We cannot prohibit some of the production or industry production of hemp based on current state law revisions. Is that correct? So, so hemp is not marijuana and so is not treated in the same manner. We so, can prohibit it altogether, correct? I'm, I'm actually unclear on whether that's an option. Under Amendment 64 to the Constitution, hemp was excluded out as a, uh, um, a, a uh, agricultural product that could be processed and used in the state and could not be prohibited. So to answer your question, we would have to treat hemp in the same manner that we treat other limited industrial activities. And the only reason we're prohibiting a part of the process is because in our limited industrial area, we allow the sensitive receptors and uh, it's just not compatible with daycare and gymnastics and, and those sorts of uses. So uh, we have to treat hemp at least the part that we're asking you to allow in the same manner as other limited industrial. And we don't have a general industrial area in the town which would be the most appropriate. And there I think we'd have to allow it if we had such a district, the full, um, the full operation and manufacturing. So is it safe to say that we have to treat hemp the same way we treat soybeans or safflower Correct. or anything else? Correct. And the reason that we can't or don't allow it or will not allow it, excuse me, in the light industrial is because that the processing is very dangerous, very flammable, and very Correct. no odor, no odor producing. Correct. And nothing to do with it's a distant cousin of marijuana. We can't restrict it for that reason, simply because the the risk of the production is high and the smell of production is high. Correct. The local option was limited to prohibiting um, marijuana itself and not hemp, which was specifically excluded from Amendment 64. So just to clarify, as this ordinance is presented to us, 
it's not going to allow the preliminary processing of hemp, but we have to allow a secondary processing of it. it that's exactly right. Okay. okay. Other questions? No? Okay, we'll open it up for public comment at 8.24 p.m. if there's anyone wishing to address council. Seeing none, we'll close public comment at 8.24 and I'd entertain further discussion or a motion, please. I move to approve ordinance number 3.01.120 on second reading. Second. We have a motion from Josh and a second from Debbie. Council, please vote. thinking motion passes four to one with one no vote from Cheryl Pogue next item up is item B which thing. is ordinance number 9.286.1 on second we okay guys okay Next up, we have ordinance number 9.286.1 on second reading. This is a bill for an ordinance to approve the first amendment to an intergovernmental agreement between the town of Parker and the Board of County Commissioners of the County of Douglas, State of Colorado, regarding cost sharing for the Dransfeld Road extension. And either Chris Hudson had some major surgery done, <laughs> or Tom's going to lead us tonight. So Chris is spending quality time with his daughter at uh, Denver Traffic Court. So he oh, can be oh. here. <laughs> oh. Oh, well, Out. Moment well, of silence for her. <laughs> Hopefully she's not going to watch the recording. Sorry, Lauren. Um, oh, all right. <laughs> Uh, uh, uh. So thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Um, this is the first amendment to an intergovernmental agreement between the town and Douglas County, uh, an agreement that was originally approved by town council in uh, June of this year. So the town has been contemplating this project, which is the extension of Transfelt Road south of 20 Mile Road for uh, several years now. Um, this is a pretty important project for the town. It's going to provide a parallel route uh, to Parker Road, essentially from Stroh Road all the way up to Pine Drive via Dransfelt Road and Motzenbacher. I'll show you here in a minute on our uh, vicinity map. A portion of this roadway is actually within Douglas County, unincorporated Douglas County, and is going to span the uh, floodplain. So we've requested a, a partnership from Douglas County on this project for a couple of years now, and they have now indicated that they're willing to participate in the project. So this is a vicinity map um, of the project area. The, the roadway improvements are what's in uh, orange on this vicinity map. This is approximately where the project will start, which is at the intersection of Dransfelt Road and 20 Mile Road. Um, Transfoot Road would be extended from that intersection to the south and to the west and ultimately tie into Motzenbacher Road adjacent to the town Salisbury Park area. Um, Motzenbacher Road will also be realigned with this particular project. Um, this project is not only an important project from a transportation perspective, but it also provides a front door access, if you will, to the um, regional, Salisbury Park Regional Park, which will be expanded to the north on the undeveloped uh, property in this area here. Um, this project is also important from an economic development perspective because it will provide um, commercial development opportunities on property that uh, currently do not exist without the roadway. Um, the road's also gonna provide additional access and transportation and traffic networking for the existing development, um, commercial development that occurs in this area that doesn't exist today as well. So as I mentioned earlier, this uh, IGA, the original IGA was uh, approved by town council on June 3rd, 2019. And the IGA that was approved by town council was to fund the conceptual design as well as the hydraulic analysis and the federal permitting associated with the floodplain modifications. That original IGA was um, brought to the Board of County Commissioners on August 13th, and due to public comment that was received at that commissioner's meeting, the commissioners decided to take no action 
um, on the IG at that point. Um, that gave staff um, at both the county and the town time to prepare an amendment to address some of the issues that were brought up at that public meeting. Um, the Board of Commission County Commissioners actually approved this IGA and the amendment at their October 22nd, 2019 meeting, so just a couple of weeks ago. So this IGA amendment really covers three areas um, that, that's important to, um, to the project. The first of which is it will allow the town and the county to utilize a um, water resources consultant um, on this project. It's a consultant that the Urban Drainage and Flood Control District and the town are already under contract to do um, design work for Cherry Creek just upstream of this particular project on the KOA property. So um, this consulting firm has expertise in this area, very capable and qualified firm, and we think that there's going to be a cost savings um, by utilizing this, this engineering firm, and it will allow the two projects to, to mesh together because there will be drainage improvements that will need to be designed and built as part of the bridge project, which is going to be abutting um, the urban drainage project. Um, the other uh, thing that this amendment does is it will define the limits of the hydraulic analysis and the what we call CLOMER that will be need to be processed for the bridge and the floodplain modifications um, on the property. So this clomer will extend approximately 1,000 upstream of, up, feet upstream of the bridge, as well as downstream of the bridge, and it will identify whatever hydraulic impacts or floodplain impacts result from that bridge, and we would mitigate for those as part of the process. Um, the last thing that the IGA will do is because there was the delay in the original approval is the original IGA had a completion date of this conceptual effort, concept design, and hydraulic analysis by July 31st of 2020. We're going to extend that to December 31st, 2020, to give us extra time to be able to get all that, uh, all those tasks completed. Um, this IGA and the IGA amendment is only going to fund the preliminary design and the CLOMER. We'll have to come back to you to get funding for the final design, as well as any construction uh, funding needed to build the project. So staff, uh, both the county and the town, recommend approval of the ordinance approving the IGA. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you very much, Tom. Questions, uh, John? Yeah, uh, thank you. So, so this, uh, this project, um, I think Councilman Rivera and I, one of our first meetings, <laughs> We had, back when we got elected, was with Chris Hudson, and we, uh, we were given a 10-year CIP map. And this, this is the exact one that I was given back in 2013. And, um, you know, typically, you take a look, and um, you look for the big numbers, and you look for the things that are farther out that you can potentially work toward to, uh, to improve this town. Uh, because the, the things in the near term, the previous councils have already kind of teed up. And, uh, you know, this was one of those two projects. There's the, the other one, Cottonwood Bridge, um, that sort of jumped out at us. And, um, you know, for us, the, the Dronsfeld um, extension was something, I think, more of an economic development um, tool or, or um, solution as, as we looked at it. And um, as, as CDOT had no funding and as Parker Road became more, um, uh, more dense, more congested, um, I saw on the, on the town's uh, Facebook feed that uh, by 2040, um, Parker Road is going to increase uh, traffic by up to 25%. So with that, um, uh, CDOT is challenged to address the $9 billion in, um, in, in things that they have currently that, that they just can't find money for. So we need to work and find different ways to provide relief. And Tom has uh, hit upon something that I've been drilling into my, my fellow, um, uh, fellow people that I worked with here, as well as uh, the commissioners, uh, parallel route to Parker. And um, this will provide a west side parallel route to Parker. Uh, we're working on the east side uh, to try and create pine to connect to Aurora Parkway over E470 to create another parallel route to Parker, because if we don't do it, we know CDOT's not going to do it. <laughs> so, um, you know, for us, um, I greatly appreciate the tenacity that Tom and Chris, uh, Chris have done uh, for getting this to, the, um, to um, the point where we can create some um, information, some design work, so we can understand the concept and hopefully work with uh, the, the fellow land landholder. 
And uh, our commissioners uh, up in Douglas County have, um, have been fantastic to work with as well as their staff as well. So um, I appreciate everybody, everybody's efforts all around. And again, this is just something that if we can move forward and, um, and get this thing done, um, I think all of Parker will benefit. Okay. Other questions? Cheryl? Tom, in the resolution itself or the ordinance itself, I didn't see any recommended cost. Do you have that? So right now we do have a concept preliminary estimate on the bridge project, and it's around 18 to $19 million total. Um, but what's being approved tonight is not the 18 or $19 million dollars tonight, for that. Yes. What I'm asking you is what tonight? So tonight we are in a, still right behind you. Yeah. yeah, you almost got hit by a finance director. <laughs> yeah. It's not $18 million tonight. Um, it is $250,000, which is split between the county and the town, so $125,000 each. All right, thank you. Okay, other questions? No, a statement, and, and, and Dayak, Dayak said, it, said it all. This, is, this has been uh, something we've, we've hoped to see for a long time. Um, we've taken some big steps towards this finally, and the county is, is becoming a very invaluable partner. Um, if you know right now, all of Horseshoe, most of Bradbury, all of those areas have to go either to Hess and then up Parker Road to get to Walmart, Target, Home Depot, or up to Main Street and already overloaded road um, to get down to Target, Walmart, and, and Home Depot. And to create that parallel um, benefits us as a sales tax collector, but also benefits a citizen for less time on their, on their travel. And uh, it just allows... And it, it just allows uh, more more movement in our city and and, and just uh, a much needed much needed connection. Okay. Other questions? Okay. All right. We'll go ahead and open it up for public comment at eight thirty six p.m. If there's anyone here wishing to address council on this. If you'll state your name and addresses for names and addresses for the record, please. My name is Mike Smith. My address is 11321 Dransfelt Road, Parker. This is my sister, Pat. Hi, Pat Breeden. My address is 11090 Night Heron Drive, Parker. Okay. All right. Um, Mayor and Council, we'd like to address you tonight on this amendment for the original IGA. And if you could bring up the first, the map, the page there. Yeah. We owned well, the Denver Pope Family Limited Partnership, which we are members of the partnership. We own that little piece of property right there, which consists of about 38 and a quarter acres. And as you can tell, the Dransfelt Road extension is directly going to impact our entire farm there. So we were concerned about, you know, the impact totally and at the Board of County Commissioners meeting in, when was it, June, you said? The public comment was me that, um, that uh, subjected the commissioners not to act upon the IGA at that time. But since that time, um, Tom and Chris and town staff and my team of consultants and everything have worked out a lot of details, and one of the main ones about the original IGA, there was no um, specific guidelines of, in the IGA on how our property would be represented in the, in the studies, because the, the road's going to impact the entire farm. Most of our farm is in the floodplain right now, so it was real important to us that we had good guidelines set in place on how we were going to be represented. And in the amendment, those um, guidelines have been put in place by the, the slide where it says background, mm -hmm. second or third. Yeah, defining the limits of the floodplain conditional letter vision, you know, from 1,000 feet upstream of the bridge and then to the power line, the XL Energy power line, which cons in all of the flood plain and flood way area within that limit contains our entire farm. So we are satisfied with the limits of the study as it was put in the amendment. So, okay. Any of the adding thing? No. Sounds mm -hmm. good. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Anyone else here to address council on this item?
Name and address for the record again. Uh, Chris Ross in 20506 Willow Bend Lane, Parker, Colorado. I really feel like I got my money's worth out of this meeting tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Glad I got tomorrow off. Um, <laughs> so what I want to say is um, just kind of the same theme is what I heard the gentleman say was we have an opportunity to move quite a bit of traffic. And again, traffic is more than just cars, right? So if anybody here has tried to, uh, uh, other than drive down uh, Dransville or 20 Mile, it's a harrowing experience. I've done it on two wheels just for fun. And it, it's, pretty, it's pretty rough. So obviously when that road was designed, we didn't think about people were gonna move around more than just their car, I get that. But we have an opportunity today to develop kind of a, a really a bridge slash road, um, but there's gonna be elevation changes um, and it's gonna be fairly scenic the way I imagine this to be. And it is also gonna go over Cherry Creek. So real quick, a couple of things. If we have a chance to make a bridge, a roadway, whatever we're gonna do today, we have the opportunity to say a couple of things. We can say it can have um, eight foot lanes on each side of the road, just like the major roads we plan today to have a cycling lane, we can make sure each side has an eight foot sidewalk um, the entire length. And also what I would like is for us to look at it tying into Cherry Creek where it crosses Cherry Creek. Because again, if you're rolling down Cherry Creek, you can go, ooh, I wanna go up there and then go, I wanna go down to Target. It sounds a little crazy today to think that, why would somebody wanna do that? But if you think about it right now, we sort of have a situation over on Mott's and Barker where the park is. You really can't move around by anywhere by, by car, which is a challenge over by Target, it's really tar it's getting better to move around. So think about it like this. You're gonna build a bridge today between two places that are sort of getting better to move around by foot and by car. You have a chance to build a bridge that can actually connect those two places and essentially for today, today for free, we can add all these amenities in and it costs us nothing. So what I'm asking is to put in the design guidelines to make sure we have those amenities. If that makes any sense, I'll be good. I'll talk to you guys afterwards about this. Right? <laughs> so that's my comment. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else here, else here to address council on this item? Okay, seeing none, we'll close public comment at 8.41 p.m. Council, I would entertain further discussion or a motion, please. Just a quick question. Can you, can you Tom, can you speak to, though we know that things aren't free, um, can you speak to our design guidelines and, and what that road would look like? Yes, sir. So the, any road that we design right now as part of a capital improvement project will follow our latest roadway standards. Um, this will be designed as a collector roadway, which will include um, bike lanes, on-street bike lanes, as well as an eight-foot detached or attached sidewalk on both sides. Uh, we also do have um, a plan to connect the roadway sidewalks into the Cherry Creek Trail, which will pass underneath the bridge um, along Cherry Creek. Thank you, sir. Okay. Cheryl. Yeah, I just want to, <laughs> I want to thank the, the Pope family. I know this has been an ongoing issue for your family, so I'm glad to hear you support this particular version. Okay, any questions, guys? All right, entertain a motion, please. I move to approve oh. ordinance number 9.286.1 on second reading. Second. Motion by Debbie and a second by John. Council, please vote. Nothing. You got anything? Nope. Yeah, nothing. All right, uh, Josh. Aye. Cheryl. Aye. Jo uh, Jeff. Yes. Debbie. Yes. John. Yes. Okay, motion passes unanimously. Ne time next item up on our agenda is item C. This is for ordinance number 3.01.121 on second reading. This is a bill for an ordinance to amend sections 13.12.030 C, D, and E. 13.12.040 B, C, and E of the Parker Municipal Code concerning commercial wireless communications facilities. We're just moving stuff around all over the place. Bryce, you're, you're going to be rocking back. and rolling tonight. Let's I'm go. Back. Um, so as, as noted before you tonight is an ordinance to amend the wireless communication facility part of the land development ordinance. Hmm. 
sorry, I'm having some technical difficulties. No. It seems to be apparently a theme it's a theme tonight. <laughs> I didn't touch it. I didn't do that. Do we have any teenagers in the room who can fix the computers? <laughs> right. Yeah. No, no so, tango. So I, I will just start talking, and I apologize. I don't have slides to, um, okay. to work with. Back in 2017, the town collaborated with uh, Verizon Wireless to make significant changes to Section 13.12 of the Parker Municipal Code regarding um, changes in state statute that require the town to allow for the installation of small cells, uh, small cellular facilities, within the town's public right-of-ways. Over the past few months, the town has started processing applications for the installation of these small cells and discovered some gaps in the town code that uh, the, the uh, ordinance today are proposed to address. So the purpose of the uh, proposed amendments are to set consistent height standards for small cell facilities that are located in the right-of-way. Um, and having different heights for local roads uh, versus collector and arterial roads. Uh, to clarify additional submittal requirements as determined by the town for small cell facilities, uh, we have been requiring these additional items, but it's good to have it uh, clarified in the code. Uh, to increase the fee for small cell facilities for review and to clarify height requirements for roof-mounted wireless communication facilities. Our current code allows heights of up to the maximum height permitted in the zone district for small cell facilities. Federal law allows for heights up to 50 feet. Uh, this proposed amendment would uh, have a maximum on local roads of 35 feet in height, uh, 40 feet with planning director approval. Um, for a collector on arterial roads, it would be a maximum of 40 feet and 45 feet with planning director approval. The intent of the different heights uh, deal with not only the context of what's on the side of the road, but the intent to encourage these uh, facilities to be on collector and arterial roads, not on local roads and neighborhoods. A clarification of the submittal items. Uh, the town does and may request the following as part of a permit application traffic control plan for when they're putting the facility in, a certificate of insurance, equipment declaration, and then the site supplement agreement. Increased application fees. Uh, the ordinance proposes an increase in fees for small cell reviews. Purpose of this increase is to cover the cost of hiring professionals with expertise in the wireless communication field as needed for certain reviews. Uh, roof mountain mounted facility height. So these are facilities that are uh, mounted on the top of an existing building. Current code allows heights of up to 12 feet above the building, but does not create clarity regarding compliance with maximum zoning heights. Now, the town does desire to encourage co-location of towers on, or of facilities on existing structures uh, versus the construction of new towers. So the proposed amendment uh, would require, would still allow building uh, mounted facilities to be 12 feet in height above the building. However, it clarifies that there's a cap on the maximum height, which is five foot above the zoning and requires that it be stealth in nature. So uh, look fit into the architecture of the building. Christmas trees. <laughs> Christmas trees. <laughs> Palm trees. Palm trees. <laughs> um, some examples of how that might work. Maximum zoning height, uh, if a maximum zoning height is 45 feet, if the building is uh, 38 feet and the rooftop facility is seven feet, that would be permitted. Um, again, 45 foot maximum height, if the building height's 38 feet and the facility is 12 feet, that is above the uh, 50 feet and therefore it would not be permitted. Um, also, same concept, maximum height of 45 feet building height of 20 feet um, with the towers at 15 feet, they would not be permitted because they're above the maximum 12 feet above the building. And this conversation looks much better with the graphic, so I apologize. Close your eyes and imagine. Yeah. Imagine a table. <laughs> uh, Planning Commission held a public meeting on October 24th 
and unanimously recommended that Town Council approve Ordinance 3.01.121, amending the Land Development Ordinance regarding wireless communication facilities. As always, I'm available for any questions you may have. Thanks, Bryce. Council questions for Bryce? Josh? So I just, for the record, I want to uh, state my appreciation uh, to wireless, to Verizon Wireless for the collab collaboration on this. Um, like the railroads, um, they can pretty much do whatever they want. So for the fact that we got them to come to the table and they're representing their, their, um, their industry um, to hopefully, I believe, better uh, the towers in, in our area. If they wanted, they could put a tower anywhere in our right of way, um, not on a light pole, standing by itself, but the fact that they're willing to work with us and, and put them on our, on our light poles and, and impact the citizens to a, to a lesser amount um, is huge. Um, Real quick though, can I, do you happen to know, or maybe Tom knows the average height of the IRA street lights throughout town? So you can correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> um, so they were actually lower on local streets. Okay. Um, I believe it's 28 feet in local streets okay. and 32. Right. Look at that. Look at that. So, so they, could, you know what, though, they could be making that up and they're just really shaking, you know, <laughs> common courtesy, shake your head yes. That's just, you know, it's actually 42 and a half feet. You know, you just know. <laughs> yeah, we don't, That's all good. Okay. We didn't measure. Other questions? All right. We'll open it up for public comment at 8.51 p.m. If there's anyone here wishing to address council on it. Last chance of the night, guys. Chris. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing none, we'll close public comment at 8.51 and I'd entertain further discussion or a motion, please. I move to approve ordinance number 3.01.121 on second reading. Second. Motion by Josh and a second by John. Council, please vote. Oops. Oh, and you turned yeah, yours off. Work. Come on, <laughs> dude. Is this your first time? Everyone else? Oh, is it, it came up. Look at that. It worked. The box is working. Oh, look at that. The Mac. It's because it's a Mac. I'll oh, stop. <laughs> Everyone, I'm looking at Chris for her to give the... We're done. There we go. Close Motion out. passes unanimously. With no further business before council, we will adjourn at 8.51 p.m.